Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! In college, I worked for a computer parts store in their build your own section. Let's call this place Macro Point. I was a good seller and made a ton of money, something like $2,400 a check. I was very happy and feeling myself. I even bought a shirt that said DJ Breadwinner and would wear it under my nice clothes all the time. The job was easy if you followed two simple rules. One, never sell them something they don't need and two, the customer only has the options you give them. The latter seems a bit disingenuous but if you follow one, you'll never go wrong with two. My two biggest abilities were that a. I helped everyone and was very polite and energetic so I got a lot of repeat customers who would wait and deal only with me and b. I could sell warranties like nobody's business. The warranties were easy to sell since we had an accidental damage plan on most items and one that replaced components in a build if you paid us to build it. I would simply say something like, you want to buy the accidental damage plan? It may be expensive, but it lasts three years. Put that date in your phone on your calendar. A week before it's up, throw this son of a witch at a wall and then come get the latest model for free. The plan says they might ask a few questions, but the truth is they didn't. With accidental damage, bring in a broken item, get the same, or if that's not available, usually not. Get the latest price equivalent model. Most people took that bit and I was very successful. Things were great until we got a new manager for our department. We will call him Jerk Manager. He was, as his name implies, jerk and incompetent. He had come over from Circuit Metropolis and had been a store manager or something. Their business had just folded. He brought all kinds of new and stupid ideas to the department. The worst was switching how we did cleaning and stocking. Before, we cleaned at night and stocked periodically in the early morning when it was slow. When the truck came, the jerk manager wanted us to clean in the morning, so we were on a floor for the early morning customers and stock at night. Because anything that wasn't fully stocked in our department through the day went up when we merchandise at night and cleaned. I think he was trying to stop us from getting overtime or something. Which is too big because we made like $5 an hour plus commission. Our hourly wage was jack crap. The biggest problem here is that things are the truck car in the system. So when a customer wants something, the system says we have it. And it's not on a shelf. We have to waste time not being on a floor going to look for things in the pallets and that hurts our sales. This is a completely stupid idea that failed spectacularly. And I earned the ire of jerk manager by going to the store manager after our objections were ignored and explaining it. I may have earned his undying ire when he told the store manager that this is the way that they did it back at Circuit Metropolis. And I remarked that that was probably why they went out of business. In my defense, crew, jerk manager. He was costing me like $500 a check. Eventually, this got fixed, but a new issue started and this one was really annoying. Now, we're not allowed to sell in other departments unless they were connected to or up sales on our builds. TV, Apple, games, and general section in the middle of the store. I and others had mastered upselling whole TVs instead of monitors and gaming peripherals and all that. We got a higher percentage of peripherals and core sales, so making a TV a peripheral was big money. Jerk manager who was trying to buddy up to the hot chick who ran the department had forbidden us to upsell TVs or hand that off as a separate things for the TV people. This did not go over well in our department. As a lead salesman in my department, I was particularly pissed. But he threatened write-ups for anyone who disobeyed and the store manager was tired of us going around jerk manager so he just started saying it's his department. He eventually forbade us from upselling anywhere else in the store. I'm like, cool bet. Cue the malicious compliance. You see, even if it's from other departments, if the sale starts in our department, 
the numbers are attributed to our department. This here affects jerk manager's bonus, but also the only reason more TVs were being sold in the first place was that we were convincing gamers to get big TVs and use them as monitors instead of monitors. So when we stopped doing that, unit stopped going out with the same frequency and the numbers for our department dropped sharply. It was actually rough to get all the salespeople to just stick to our department and not go around jerk manager. But it only took about two months for anyone to start noticing the problem. They called a meeting of the departments and talked about TV and BYO, underperforming. When they asked why, I feigned ignorance and just said we were following what jerk manager said. We let the store manager slowly piece together why things were happening. Jerk manager got chewed out and TV lady, let's call her legs for days, was also chewed out. We didn't know why at first, but apparently she'd done this to the manager before the manager that hired me. The one before jerk manager was a woman, but her predecessor was a man. Apparently Licks for Days had a way of flirting and getting special treatment for her department and taking advantage of idiots like jerk manager. I'd like to say that was the end and jerk manager eased up and got out of the way, but no, he was pity and a jerk. He conspired with Snake, someone of his own culture, to get rid of me. I found this out because Snake was popular with the girls but also talked too much. He would allow Snake to upsell in our area and had one of the girls often remove my sticker and put snakes on it. He started scheduling me at weird times and started selling the store manager on the idea that I was detrimental to the morale of the department. A lot of them were lazy and relied on a pool when you don't help someone and they buy something. A lot of them were lazy and relied on a pool. When you don't help someone and they buy something, the money goes into the pool and is distributed amongst the entire department. If it doesn't look like a big build, some folks would just let that go to the pool. I did not. I helped everyone and turned small items into big purchases. Admittedly, that hurt everyone else's pockets. But we're told to help everyone and to absolutely not be lazy and let things go to the pool. So the weird way it ended up being explained to me is that if I sold 10 of an item, I got paid let's say 100 bucks because of a multiplier or whatever. But if I sold 5 and someone else sold 5, no one would get the multiplier. And thus, they would pay each $40 or something, instead of paying 100 for the same amount of merch being sold. It was all convoluted and sounded like a BS excuse, but jerk manager ended up convincing them that they couldn't afford me right then. Normally they fire people on a spot because we've got a high risk of theft, but they let me work those last two weeks. I asked what he expected me to do and he told me I expect you to sell. So sell I did. Cue malicious compliance too. I was going to show them what they were losing. I wanted them to feel my absence. I was determined to try to break the sales record my last few days and totally came close. I was averaging something like $7,800 in sales, way up from my $3,000 a day, which still had me around the best. See, the record was somewhere around $14,000 in a day and I hit $11,000 and $13,000, but sadly could not hit the record. But my numbers were insane during that time. My last check was too bit high. But alas, jerk manager did manage to get me out of there, though the store manager said he'd hire me back if things changed. Instead, jerk manager waited a month and moved Snake into my place in the department. Needless to say, their numbers were not the same. I didn't get my closure on this until about four months later when I found jerk manager and the store manager had been fired. They opened a Bengal direct across the way and Macro Point had been losing clients and money. Of course, apparently my department hadn't really recovered from my loss. Things came to a head at a quarterly meeting when the regional manager came to present the top sales awards and apparently I had won it, even missing two months or so of sales. No one had told him that I had been fired, so he looked like an idiot trying to present the award. There was a banner and everything. I also found out that Snake got fired for two separate offenses, stealing which they were investigating and having an affair with one of the cashiers in the back, which led to his immediate termination. 
is a comment that jerk manager had caught Snake before doing something inappropriate and just gave him a vague write up. That, the debacle was me, and the low sales got the jerk manager fired. I received the call to see if I wanted to come back, but I had already taken on extra classes by then. Double malicious compliance time here. This happened a few days ago, so my manager is something of a goofball. He's exactly the kind of weirdo that I like to work under and is always joking about something, even when he's in a bad mood. Luckily, he's also willing to take care of business at work when necessary. That is exactly what my workplace needs. We have a group chat app specifically for our workplace, where every employee of our store and every supervisor above us, up to the franchise owners, can see. On a weekly basis, my manager posts our week schedule to the group chat so that everyone has access. And those who don't use the app or have a smartphone use a paper copy that's posted in store. Right on time, my manager posts the schedule and a bit of text joking about being a benevolent overlord. And that he demands gifts in exchange for this week's schedule to be deposited in a box in the manager's office at the beginning of your next shift. Of course, we all knew he was joking, but I had to ask what everyone was thinking. Is mayonnaise a gift? He responds with, put it in a box. I'd bet. See, my manager knows me well enough to understand that I enjoy shenanigans. However, he didn't expect me to actually bring him mayonnaise as a gift first thing in the morning. After a long discussion in the group chat about possible delivery methods for the mayo in question, with suggestions such as coating the bottom of a Lego prick and then freezing it out of spite, and mayonnaise cake, except instead of a cake with mayo in a batter, it's a loaf of bread with an inch-thick layer of mayo. I decided on my plan. Before work, I stopped by the good old golden arches. I grab breakfast from there fairly often, so I figured that was my best option. I pulled up to the window to pay for my order and asked the poor lady for a strange favor. And the way she looked at me when I asked if I could pay them to fill a small drink cup with mayo was priceless, and I was a bit defeated when she offered me packets. I considered momentarily asking for it in an ice cream cone, but I decided to take what I could get before she called the police. I arrived at the store and immediately approached my manager and tried to hand him a dozen packets of McDonald's brand light mayo. He tells me to take it to the office and put it in a box, which I do. We have a laugh and get on with our day. Well, toward the end of my shift, it's time for a secondary malicious compliance. He's at the front behind the counter and the store is completely devoid of customers. He loudly yells that he needs me to feed him a packet of that mayo because He's got his hands full and cannot do it himself. Sure thing. I walk my happy self to that manager's office, snag a pack of mayo and rip the corner right out of that jerk. I can hear him at the front laughing and being a goofball, having already forgotten what he had ordered me to do and his eyes got real big when he saw me approaching with that mayo. I told him, open up. To his credit, he did. And I poured that entire packet of McDonald's brand light mayo directly into his mouth. And for our co-workers that were in present, I posted in group chat, I can finally say that I fed my manager a pouch of mayo like the world's most terrifying baby bird. Got a few laughs and felt nice. On to the fallout. Nothing super terrible, thankfully, but my manager had a meeting with the franchise owners the next day. Had been planned long before the mayo conversation took place. He returned from that meeting and pulled me aside and said that the owners asked him to talk to me about being professional in our group chat and that my comment about feeding him mayo like a baby bird was inappropriate and that it probably shouldn't happen in store again. He wasn't being seriously reprimanded and they were laughing too, but man, it was great to hear that even the owners were getting in on the fun. It all started when a moving truck rolled up next to the house next door one day. I remember cause I was trying to enjoy my second cup of coffee in peace, but nope. Karen and her mini-me, a spunky 8-year-old with more sass than you'd find in a teen drama series, came barreling into our quiet little slice of suburbia like a hurricane on steroids. A spunky 8-year-old with more sass than you'd find in a teen drama series came barreling into our quiet little slice of suburbia like a hurricane on steroids. 
Morning. I called out over the fence trying to sound neighborly. Karen looked my way, half smiling as if it cost her something. Karen. Not her real name, of course. She said that, not bothering to walk closer. Her daughter, meanwhile, was busy examining her new kingdom. I should have known then and there, peace was a thing of the past. The next few days were a blur of loud noises, late-night car alarms, courtesy of Karen's forgetfulness, and her daughter. Let's call her Miss S, terrorizing the local pets. I tried to talk to Karen about it. Really, I did. Hey, Karen, do you think you could um, keep it down in the evenings and maybe have a chat with your daughter about our pet? She's kind of attached to it and, well, he's been coming home terrified. Karen huffed, flipping her unbrushed hair. Kids will be kids, right? Can't cage them up. They need to express themselves. I bit my tongue, thinking sure, but maybe not at the expense of Mr. Whiskers' sanity. The neighborhood barbecue was the first real taste of Karen's delightful personality. She cornered me by the grill, a plastic smile plastered on her face. So this is nice, huh? But you don't do things like this often. That was the way those weeds are encroaching on your driveway. I chuckled, thinking she was joking. But she wasn't. Oh yeah, we're real slackers. Gotta keep the neighborhood atheistic down somehow. She didn't laugh. Note to self, Karen doesn't do humor. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. There were moments of, well, if not exactly friendship, then a sort of truce. Like the time Karen's car wouldn't start and despite everything, I went over with my trusty jumper cables. You know, you're... You know, you're not as useless as you look. She said, a backhanded compliment if I ever heard one. Um, thanks, I try. I shot back, hiding my smirk as her car sputtered to life. And then there was Miss Sass. A whirlwind of energy always up to something. She had this way of looking at you, like she was plotting the next big neighborhood scandal. I caught her once red-handed drawing what she claimed was a masterpiece, but my driveway was chalk. That's colorful. I said, I am the abstract chaos. It's a unicorn, duh. She rolled her eyes all dramatic-like before adding, You're not as boring as my mom says. Uh, thanks, kid. I'll take that as a compliment. Our interactions were like that, sprinkled with a weird mix of insults and grudging respects. It wasn't perfect, but it was our normal. Little did I know the real drama was just around the corner, waiting for the perfect moment turn our lives upside down. One evening, while I was attempting to master the art of grilling without giving my family food poisoning, the smell of charred burgers wafting through the air, Karen popped her head over the fence. You know, if you keep cooking like that, you're gonna set the whole neighborhood on fire. I flipped the burger, sending a small flare up into the air, as if on cue. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Karen. Wanna sign up for the first taste test? She made a face that clearly said she'd rather eat her own shoe, but then surprised me. Throw one of those less charred pieces over. My daughter is driving me nuts about getting a burger. Grilling diplomacy, I thought, chucking a decently cooked patty over the fence. Maybe food was the way to peace. The peace lasted all of two days. Our kids, plus their souls, tried to get along, but Miss Sass had a talent for stirring the pot. A game of backyard soccer ended with her declaring, This game is dumb. You're all playing it wrong anyway. My son trying to be diplomatic suggested maybe they could play something else. Miss Sass huffed. I don't play with losers. And she stormed off, leaving my son bewildered and me trying not to laugh at the absurdity of it all. Kids, huh? But it wasn't just the kids. Karen had a knack for making the simplest interactions complicated, like the time she complained about a tree shitting leaves into her yard. It's your tree, so it's your mess, she declared one morning, arms crossed as she surveyed the battlefield of her meticulously kept lawn versus nature. I'll get right on that, I said, scratching my head. Should I talk to the clouds about directing the rain only onto my property? Karen did not appreciate the sarcasm. Another note to self, she really didn't do humor. As my daughter's first day approached... The atmosphere in our home shifted from casual day-to-day -day management of Karen-induced headaches to a mission control center for what my husband dubbed the party of the century. He was determined to make it a memorable event, free from neighborhood drama. And that meant one thing. Karen and Miss Sass were on the guest list. 
The day of the party arrived and our backyard transformed into a child's wonderland. Balloons danced in the breeze, a magician wandered among the guests, pulling coins from ears and laughter filled the air. It was perfect, peaceful even. Then a peace was shattered. Halfway through the magician's act, a shadow fell over the party. Karen was Miss Sass, in tow, had decided to crash the circus, uninvited but undeterred. They marched in as if fled by a parade. Thought we'd drop by. We didn't want to miss the fun, Karen announced. A plastic smile stretched across her face. Miss Sass wasted no time mingling. Her version of which involved commandeering the magician for a private show and critiquing his rapid as unrealistic. I got my husband's eye, a silent conversation passing between us. This is fine, we can manage. Except as history had proven time and again, managing Karen and her offspring was like trying to juggle soap in the shower. Slippery and ultimately futile. The breaking point came during cake time. Miss Sass, ever the critic, had a running commentary on each gift my daughter opened. My mom wouldn't let me play with that. Too babyish. Or... I have one of those, but mine's better. Guests tried to ignore her, but the tension thickened. The air heavy was unspoken pleas for someone to reign in the chaos child. But Karen, she was too busy regaling a group of parents with tales of her exhausting role as a neighborhood's unofficial watchdog. It was then with the unwrapping of the final gift, a Barbie dream house, that the proverbial camel's back broke. Miss Sass, unable to contain her envy, launched herself at the toy before my daughter could even touch it, declaring, I need to play with this. That was it. Party over. Diplomacy failed. It was time for Karen and her mini-me to leave. But as we'd soon find out, the real drama was just hours away, lurking in the shadows of what should have been a day of celebration. The chaos of the party had barely settled when darkness fell over our neighborhood. The guests had left, leaving behind a battlefield of wrapping paper and half-eaten slices of cake. We were in the midst of post-party cleanup, a task more daunting than anticipating, when the piece was abruptly shattered. It wasn't the crash of a fallen dish or the predictable cry of an overtired child that alerted us to the intrusion. It was a scream, sharp, piercing, and undeniably filled with terror. It came from my daughter's room. Adrenaline surged as my husband and I exchanged a glance that needed no words. We bolted upstairs, hearts pounding, fearing the worst but unprepared for what we would find. The scene that greeted us was one straight out of a nightmare. There, in the middle of my daughter's room, stood a figure so bizarre and unsettling it took a moment for our brains to register what we were seeing. It was Karen, her hair wilder than ever, standing over my daughter's bed and my daughter was pressed against the wall, tears streaming down her face, frozen in terror. What the? I began, but was cut off by Karen's manacle ranting. You think you can just exclude us? My daughter deserves that dream house more than yours ever will. Before I could process the insanity of the situation, my husband swung into action. With a baseball bat he grabbed from our hallway, he delivered a swift blow to the intruder. Karen collapsed in a heap, unconscious before she even hit the ground. The next moments were a blur of panic and hurried calls to emergency services. Lights flashed outside as police cars and an ambulance arrived, piercing the quiet of our cul-de-sac. Neighbors peered out curious from behind curtains. As Karen was loaded onto a stretcher, handcuffed to ensure she couldn't cause more harm, I couldn't believe how a feud over neighborhood trivialities escalated to this. The police were thorough, taking statements and assuring us we'd done the right thing. She broke into your home, threatened your child. You had every right to defend your family. One officer said a statement that did little to ease the weight of what had occurred. The aftermath was a haze of concern for our daughter who was understandably traumatized by the event. Sleep became elusive for her, nightmares invading her rest, leaving her and us exhausted and on edge. We learned she'd been formally charged and wouldn't be returning. Miss Sass was taken in by relatives, her future uncertain but away from the influence of her mother. As for us, we focused on healing. It was a slow process, one that involved many conversations about fear, safety, and the importance of forgiveness. 
We contemplated therapy for our daughter, willing to do whatever it took to guide her through this trauma. This didn't happen to me. I was more of a bystander at that time. I was still a nursing student then, but because I was in my last year, I worked like an RN, registered nurse, and all of that was pre-COVID. So we are in an academic hospital, so we've got a nursing school and new doctors come here to do their residency. The new resident was this kind of snobby young doctor everyone hates. He depended on the nurses for stuff like laying catheters, putting IVs in, and so on. But on the other hand, he talked down to the nursing staff and, well, just flirted with the young nurses. Male nurses, like me, are just men who were too dumb to become doctors. Yeah, really lovable kind of guy. We had a new patient with some allergies and so on. Hey, please get the patient's X medication, which was a risky one by the way, and turned out the patient wasn't allergic to that, but it was real possible that he could be. Yeah, I have to intervene. The patient could have an allergic reaction to this. The senior nurse tried to tell him, but he cut her off. Hey, do you have a medical degree or do I? How about doing your job, nurse? It got silent. Deadly silent. Like in Western when the two gunslingers face each other. Each nurse, doctor, staff in earshot was deadly silent. All eyes laid on those two. The senior nurse smiled and said, Fine, right. You're the doctor. I am the nurse. Then she left. The new resident celebrated this as his big victory. It was like in prison when the newbie defended himself and gained a bit of respect. But then came her sweet little revenge. Most nurses were at the front desk during that night shift, just talking, drinking the third cup of coffee, making paperwork and so on. A senior nurse came to all and said, Hey, you may have witnessed what happened with a new resident. We are just nurses, you know. Maybe you should only do the minimal effort for his patients. As he is a doctor, we were just nurses. Everyone liked that, so we did. Don't worry, nobody died. We are not in the ICU with the deadly cases. He was the last one to receive the files he requested. His x-rays took longer than the ones of the other doctors and no nurses were getting him anything non-work-related when he asked for it. We don't have to, but if a doctor asks really nicely, we get him a cup of coffee or something. And then it comes. The glory day of revenge. It was after a round with a cool attending doctor, who was basically Dr. Cox from Scrubs, and the new resident wasn't done with some of his diagnosis because he had to get everything himself. All of his x-rays were at the front desk. No nurse was bothered to get it for him. He had the hands full with laying catheters and putting in IVs because most of the time he asked a nurse and, well, no nurse had time for him because they had some paperwork to do. Make some beds, change some bed bands, bring a patient to the x-ray because, you know, we are just nurses. He had to work overtime more often to finish his work. And he was not happy. A word, please? The new resident asked the attending doctor. The doctor was sipping his coffee while looking at an x-ray. Yes? Or can I complain about the nursing staff? The doctor puts down the x-ray, crosses his arms and asks, If you got complaints, you go to me first. I think the nursing staff is against me. Really? Well, no surprise, newbie. You treated them really badly. I'll tell you now one thing they seem to not have taught you in your fancy mid school. The nurses are nearly running the hospital. And you screwed up with one of the senior nurses, and now you have to deal with it. The whole the attending comes to rescue ended after mid school. You understand me? The new resident looked like that shocked Pikachu meme. While that, nearly the whole staff was watching this, and the senior nurse was pleased. The new resident came crawling to apologize to her later that shift. Now, he don't get the minimal treatment anymore, but not the maximal treatment like the attending doctor. He's still a little jerk, but the senior nurse taught him a valuable lesson. Do not mess with the nurses. This is a pretty old story. It's happened back in 2018 when I used to work as a junior watchmaker and salesperson for one of the largest malls in Fiji. So during Christmas Eve, this lady, who seemed like she was in her late 40s or early 50s, came rushing up to me with a torn piece of our promotional catalog and asked me if we had the white gold men's bracelet available. As I was working for the watch department, I clearly did not have any knowledge of the availability of the item, so I said, Madam, I'm not gonna be able to confirm that. 
May I direct you to the jewelry department? While showing her to the jewelry department, which is like 5 meters away from the department I work at, where four of my colleagues were waiting to serve her. I don't know what happened, but this woman started screaming at the top of her voice, saying, I'm a VIP customer. How dare you tell me to go elsewhere to check for the item? It is your job to run and check if it is or is not available. You kids nowadays don't want to do your job and make the customers run around. After which, I explained to her that currently I'm alone at this department because the senior staffs went to check on the new deliveries and therefore cannot leave the booth that I was in and recommending that she checks with the department in charge of it was the best course of action. She didn't seem to care at this point and started screaming for the level manager at the exact moment at which the head of the department I was working for arrived and asked what happened. I explained the situation and the manager apologized on my behalf and told her that I was doing my best to keep the customer service going as a mall is full during Christmas. After which she made it clear that she wanted me fired for not prioritizing her, a VIB customer over others. The department head, who is a lady who is in her late 50s and has clearly had enough of these kind of customers working at the company for over 20 years, said to the customer that no customer is valued more than the other. All customers are treated equally and that the company doesn't believe in VIB customers. The entitled woman then tells us that her son works at a higher position at the mall and that she'd have me and my department head's job for treating her that way. A few weeks go by and I get transferred to the MAC department as a junior makeup artist. Keep in mind Fiji is a very conservative country and boys like myself, Indian, choppy and bearded, doing anything related to makeup was a weird thing. Everything was going great in life, I was happy that I had been recognized for my artistic skills by an international company for your information MAC only has two booths in the entire country. Until the day that same entitled woman comes over to the MAC department to buy some products for a New Year's party. One of my colleagues was attending to her at first until the batch of customers from the monthly Chinese cruise ship came in and she was the only one who could fluently speak Mandarin and Cantonese so naturally she asked me to provide assistance to the entitled woman and as I was trying to be as professional as possible I said gladly. Over when the entitled woman realized that I'm a boy and the same boy from the previous incident had a dramatic change in her facial expressions, she seemed standoffish and I asked her, what can I help you with madam? To which she said, I want to look as beautiful as possible for a new year's party I have been invited to. Does the party have a theme or would you like me to recommend whatever that suits you the best? Whatever, as long as I don't look like a sick boy. Okay, madam. These are some of the products I have picked out for you which I think might enhance your beauty. Would you like to try them on? Yeah, sure. I proceeded to get clean brushes from the storage compartments of our display cases and apply primer, foundation, contouring and so on. And completed the look with all the products which were added to her basket. She seemed pleased with what I had presented. She asked me to pack all the products worth around $270. To which I did then proceeded to the cash counter where she paid for the liquid foundation and compact powder foundation and not the other products. She said it's okay her son will pay for the rest and tried to walk off with the products to which I said you can only take the items if you have completely paid for them. I calmly asked for her to return the products if she doesn't plan on paying for them to which she says my son is a branch manager I should be getting these for free and as I was done with her lies. I asked her to call her son. This triggered an intense rage and she threw the bag of cosmetics against the counter breaking them and then threw in her hand back at me. Huge mistake lady. I was not to take abuse from a random lady and I called the security and in accordance with our policy she was promptly banned from our malls. She sometimes still attempts to shop at our stores but gets kicked out. It's actually embarrassing to watch. Justice served.